Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alvaro Lozano Robledo, and I want to talk about my mega favorite number, which is this gigantic number that appears on the screen. And uh, this is my favorite number because it's related to one of my favorite problems in number theory, which is my own research area. And uh, so, yeah, so this is my mega favorite number. And actually, this is not it. This is just the numerator of my favorite number, uh, which is this rational number that has another denominator that is just as gigantic as the numerator. So let me explain a little bit of uh, where this number comes from and where the uh, problem that this number comes from, what that problem is. Uh, to do that, let me backtrack about 800 years and talk a little bit about our hero here, which is uh, Leonardo Pisano. Uh, you probably know of Leonardo Pisano, but perhaps by another name. He went by uh, a few other names. He was also known as Leonardo di Pisa because he was born in Pisa, uh, but also um, because he was the son of Guglielmo Bonacci, he's actually known better as Leonardo Fibonacci, Filius Bonacci, meaning the son of Bonacci. Um, however, he was, as far as I know, he was not known as Fibonacci at the time when he lived. Uh, he was actually known by another nickname, uh, which was Leonardo Bigolo. Uh, Bigolo apparently means either good for nothing or vagrant or wanderer, which may be related to the fact that he did a lot of traveling during his time to uh, from Africa to Europe, um, or it might also mean absent-minded. Um, any one of those seems like a good description for many mathematicians I know, so I, they all fit. Um, in, that, in any case, he was known as Bigolo, uh, Fibonacci, or Pisano, and he was a very well-known mathematician of the time, so well-known that Frederick II, Holy Roman Emperor, uh, became aware of the work of Fibonacci. Um, uh, Frederick, Frederick II uh, held court in Pisa, and uh, some of the scholars of the court of uh, Frederick II uh, told him about Fibonacci and they suggested to invite Fibonacci to court. Uh, and uh, another member of the court, Johannes of Palermo, suggested uh, that we challenge Fibonacci with a number of problems and see how Fibonacci responds to these. Uh, apparently these problems came from uh, uh, other manuscripts and there, may, there might be problems that were well known at the time. For example, find the root of this cubic polynomial was a problem that was suggested to Fibonacci. But the one problem that I'm interested in is that problem, uh, which is the congruent number problem. As it was proposed to Fibonacci was to find a square which when either increased or decreased by five gives a square. Uh, meaning by a square here, they actually meant at the time a rational number uh, such that uh, it's a square and if you subtract five, add five, you get other squares. So you get uh, three squares that are in an arithmetic progression with difference five and that was the challenge to uh, Fibonacci. Uh, the problem itself, as I said, it seems Palermo collected problems that were uh, floating around at the time. Uh, we know that at least the problem is uh, more than a thousand years old. It dates to an Arab manuscript uh, about 972 AD. And the problem there is more general, give an integer, given an integer n, to find a square, x squared, such that x squared minus n and plus n are both squares. Um, so in more uh, modern terminology, uh, given a natural number n, is there a rational number x such that x squared minus n and x squared n, x squared plus n are all rational squares. So that would make n a congruent number if that is true. Uh, so for example, 24 is a congruent number because 1, 25, and 49 are rational squares with common difference 24. Uh, if you divide all of those by four, then you get three squares uh, such that their difference now is six. So six is also a, a, a congruent number. Um, more recently, though, we know the congruent number problem as a problem related to uh, triangles, to right triangles, uh, more precisely. And uh, I've just have this slide, I'm not going to go through it, but what it says is that if you have an arithmetic progression of three rational squares, then uh, the common difference is a congruent number and vice versa. Uh, 
So yeah, the common difference is what we define to be a congruent number, but you can uh, construct a right triangle whose area is n. And uh, conversely, if you have a right triangle um, with area n, then you can come up with a difference of squares uh, that gives you to an arithmetic progression of squares with common difference n. All right, so another way to pose the problem, which is the most common way now nowadays, is given a natural number n, is there a right triangle ABC with rational sides ABC whose area is precisely n? And uh, the, my favorite number is actually related to this problem, is related to whether 157 is a congruent number. We'll get there. Uh, so, for example, n equals 6 is a congruent number in this uh, way because it is the area of the right triangle 3, 4, 5. However, n equals 5 is not the area of a right triangle with integer side lengths, uh, but it is the area of a right triangle with rational side lengths, which is still allowed in the congruent number problem. It would not be allowed to do real side lengths. Uh, real lengths. Uh, so a square root of 2 is not allowed as a length. We're thinking of triangles with rational sides and then see what are the possible areas of such triangles. So in his book Floss, uh, Leonardo solved Palermo's n equals 5 challenge and he found a triple of uh, squares that are in arithmetic progression and the common difference is 5. Uh, that corresponds to the right triangle of area 5, 3 halves, 20 thirds, 41 over 6. Great. Uh, farther, in Liber Quadratorum, uh, Leonardo uh, Fibonacci returns to the congruent number problem in full generality, and he claims that uh, if n is a square, then n is not a congruent number. And uh, he gives a proof that it's an, a complicated and clear proof that I don't think it carried uh, forward and to actually find a solid proof uh, that n equals 1 or equivalent to that n being a square means that n is not a congruent number, we have to travel 400 years into the future to Toulouse, uh, where a lawyer um, who was just a math enthusiast solved this problem. Uh, another person that you probably know, uh, who is uh, Fermat. Pierre de Fermat solved uh, the problem that n equals 1 is not a congruent number, or he gave uh, a good proof of this fact, uh, which, by the way, uh, if you uh, work that out, is actually related to some other Diophantine equation, and that's the equation x to the fourth plus 4y to the fourth equals z squared has no solutions in positive integers, which is actually related to uh, or the same method can be used to solve for Maslow's theorem for n equals 4. So that's how this problem is actually related to Fermat's um, last theorem. All right, so what numbers are, what natural numbers are congruent? Um, so as I said, my, fav my favorite number is related to the question is n equals 157 a congruent number. So what do we know about congruent numbers? Let me give you a list of uh, some progress, some results that I'm going to just display on the screen. But I want, what I want you to uh, concentrate on is in the second result by Stevens in 1975 proved that if n is a prime and p is 5 or 7 mod 8, then n is congruent. And 157 is a prime, and it is congruent to 5, so it is a congruent number. So now the question is, what is the simplest right triangle with rational sides that has area 157? There is one, but it turned out to be very hard to find. Uh, so is it a congruent number? Yes, by Stevens, uh, but it took until 1993 for Don Zagier uh, where uh, when Don Zagier found the simplest right triangle with area 157, here's a picture of Zagier, and uh, here it is. So the triangle with uh, sides A, B, C, with A, B, C as in the, as in the uh, screen, that is a right triangle with area 157, and that is the simplest such triangle with area 157. And I'm always just amazed of uh, looking at these numbers and that this is the first example of such a triangle. So there it is. Um, by the way, the congruent numbers below 200 are classified, and this is a complete list of congruent numbers up to 200. And uh, what else do we know? Uh, 
uh, about the congruent number problem is that it's open. We don't know how to classify all the natural numbers that are congruent numbers, uh, but we do have some very interesting results. Uh, Tunnel, for example, in 1983, gave a criterion. I'm not going to read it out loud, but here it is, that tells you um, what, what happens if n is a congruent number, then some equalities need to happen of two finite numbers. And in fact, if the Birch and Sunderton Dyer conjecture is true, then this is an if and only if a statement, and they would give you a characterization of what numbers are uh, congruent, which is awesome, except that uh, the Birch and Sunderton Dyer conjecture, by the way, here's an example of uh, Tunnel's theorem in practice. And uh, the Birch and Sunderton Dyer conjecture is wide open. We do not know. Um, uh, we, it's not been proved, it's been proved in some cases, um, but uh, it's, um, there's still a lot to be done to actually prove this conjecture, uh, so much so that it is one of the millennium problems proposed by the Clay Math Institute, uh, so there is a million dollar reward for solving the uh, Birchens and Dyer conjecture, which would settle at least one possible classification of congruent numbers. Um, so, yeah. That's it. That's why it's my favorite number. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you for watching. Thank you. Bye.